give a warm welcome to Alex Ruas and Sam Millen. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, we are Behind Bars, and it's, uh, thank you so much for coming to see our seminar, The Future of Bar Design. It's really great to see so many people here who are really interested in um, what goes into designing a great bar. Um, what we're going to talk a little bit about today is our process, how we design bar stations, why we do the things that we do, what's important for us, uh, and how we see this process and um, uh, moving forward into the future. So, um, and then at the end, yeah, we'd love to take some questions and, and, and try to answer as, as best we can. Um, I'd like to introduce my, my friend and my, my colleague, my co-founder at Behind Bars. This is Alex Ruas. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Alex Ruas. I've been working in industry as a bartender for the last 13 years. Um, I've worked to everything from nightclubs, uh, cocktail bars, hotel bars, and uh, I understand a little bit the challenges as they go through the different uh, styles of bartending. Um, it was until I started managing and creating concepts where I, need, I needed to think about the menus, uh, how I was going to interact with the guests, the budgets, how much money I had to spend. And this is where I was first introduced to a design process where I met architects, interior designers, expectations from the owners, and kitchen manufacturers. Um, so me as a bartender, I tried to explain my challenges at work um, to people that did not understand our profession as good as we do when we work every day in a bar. Uh, so the result was pretty frustrating, uh, which created resentment. Uh, I was getting back drawings that were not specifically what I requested. Uh, the architects and interior designers wanted me to do miracles in one and a half meter space uh, with the bar that served 250 people. Uh, so I was really, really frustrated. And when you build frustrations, uh, sometimes you want to do things by yourself. So I took into that challenge and say, F you all, I'm going to do this <laughs> Sorry, um, by myself and try to do it the best I can do. Um, yeah, Sam. Uh, I'm Sam Miller. I'm also a veteran of the bar. I've 17 years working behind the bar uh, in all different types of venues from nightclubs to festivals to ski resorts, to restaurants, uh, bars, cafes. Um, and what, what I really liked uh, about working as a bartender was really, really high volume uh, places. I really like that kind of synergy between uh, what makes a good venue. Uh, guests are having a great time, bar, te bar team is working well, having fun, pushing out drinks, and the venue is making money. When we set up the company behind Bars Agency, it really provided an opportunity to take all of this knowledge you have working behind the bar um, and combine it with other, other elements to kind of funnel it into this creative process of designing a piece an integral piece of what makes a really good venue, uh, and that's a bar. So, um, yeah. Should that's, I move on? Yeah, please. Perfect. So, me, Sam, and the team, we wanted to create a mission and a vision to what, towards what we wanted to give to the industry. Uh, and we, uh, as a team, we want to reimagine re the bar industry through thoughtful and beautiful design while maintaining the practical focus of the bar owner, the bartender, and the guests. And basically, this is the pillars of how we do holistic design. We approach that philosophy <laughs> towards our entire process. Around the bigger circle, there are sy synergy that happens. We need to take a lot of different boxes to be able to create the ultimate uh, experience. Uh, it needs to look good. Uh, the production needs to be up to the level of the, our expectations. Uh, we always look into innovate and move forward doing what's next. Uh, the performance in the end of the day is the bottom line. It needs to perform and make money out of it. Uh, and for sure, the biggest one is ergonomics. 
but today we don't have a lot of time to talk all, all of them in detail. So we chose the three most important for our design process, which is ergonomics, performance, and innovation. And to kick off, we start with ergonomics. Yeah, so ergonomics as a, as a, as a discipline, if you like, is, is a quite an overarching concept. Um, it, 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 it really thinks about how humans interact with systems, if you like. Uh, for us at Behind Bars, it's quite specific. We are thinking about how the bartender is working in their workspace. Um, between us, myself, Alex, uh, and our colleague Adam, who's uh, live streaming from Oslo, he couldn't be here today, uh, we have nearly 60 years' experience working behind the bar. So we're hypersensitive and hyper um, um, uh, really tuned into how it is to stand uh, in a bar station for 8, 10, 12 hours. Uh, and push out drinks, and we're super aware of the effect that that has uh, on your body. Uh, bending with a load, turning with a load, stretching, uh, reaching, multiple uh, re repetitive movements, all of these types of things uh, we're thinking about when we design our bars. Uh, and how does that manifest itself? Well, it can be as simple as uh, the placement of the work area, placement of high rotation items in the bartender's field of reach, down to how big do we design uh, the bottle bins so you can carry them out with comfort. Um, Should I? Yeah. This, this slide you see uh, up here is uh, our, co our colleague Adam. This is his spine. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty gnarly. Um, <laughs> Just to explain a little bit, you can see a rotation of the pelvis, which has been caused by a collapsed vertebra in the back. Now, this, this came about in a simple, in a normal shift behind the bar, reaching for something, uh, and the vertebra kind of gave way. Now, this is absolutely 100% from standing 20 years behind poorly designed bars. The rehab on this injury to get back to this is a de debilitating injury and absolutely ended his career as working behind bars as a bartender. He works at behind bars, but not as a bartender. <laughs> um, so even today, now it's almost two years on, uh, he says that his, his left foot almost feels like a piece of wood. Um, so these are the type of things that, that, that we are thinking about. Performance. Yeah. Uh, so from, from ergonomics, we go uh, to performance. And when we're talking about performance, uh, we're really thinking about this bar as an integral part of the venue, um, but as a kind of machine, if you like. We're talking about what are the quantitative capabilities of this bar? How much money can you make from this station? What, how many drinks can you push out? So the way that we like to start with this type of thing is talking with our clients uh, and getting as much information as we can. Um, before, before we start anything else. So things like, what is the size of the venue? How many people in the venue, the capacity? What are the expectations for the bar on a volume scale? What is the concept of the venue? Is it a wine bar, a cocktail bar? Uh, what is going on? These, this number, this, these numbers, this data will really help to shape our design process. Um, how, how much glass storage do we need? Do we need cooling? What kind of cooling? Do we need bigger ice wells for less restock? And this kind of, these kind of metrics help us um, to understand what we can fit in a limited space because, unfortunately, um, you always have a finite amount of space of where a bar can fit. So if you're going to add elements, other elements will maybe suffer. So there's always a kind of negotiation about designing the bar station for the specific venue in mind. Um, a really good uh, example of this is we designed a bar uh, for a concert hall uh, on the west coast of Norway. I think the capacity is maybe 600 people, and they do live music, big concerts, uh, every week. And what was a little bit different with this venue is they had a real commitment to doing a complicated cocktail program. Now, there's not many live music venues that want to do this because they understand that volume is their kind of key here. But their, their target market, their, their audience, was starting to demand a higher level of drink, fast. 
So with this brief in mind, we sat with their, with their bar team and the owners and designed a station. Um, after installation, uh, the first night that they had opened with the new bar, they managed to smash their sales record by 42% with one less guy in the bar. So that kind of data for us uh, for sure is super exciting when you can get these kind of numbers. Um, and what we try to do with any of our clients and any of our installations is take these numbers following uh, installation, compare them with numbers for the same period the year before, and see, see what's happening. Uh, did we manage to make more money with this new bar? Uh, thankfully for us, <laughs> the overwhelming majority of the time is yes. And of course, there'll be variances in this information. But what it helps us to do is to put together a kind of matrix based on numbers, sales numbers, um, of, uh, no, don't leave. Uh, is able to put, put together a matrix of information that helps us going forward in the design process. What works, what doesn't, what can make more money. So when we're talking about the performance of the station, at the end of the day, we're trying to build a case um, that the bottom line will increase and, and kind of justify the investments. Great. Innovation. When we took into that challenge, we looked into a lot of how we can challenge the producers into, de into designing a better station. With the knowledge we get into working with the industry leaders, we try to take that information and push down to that 90% of the rest of the bar industry with smart, functional, uh, and performing bars. Um, the other part that we focus a lot is in the design process. Um, as I was explaining the why in the beginning, my frustration when talking with different people, getting information with, from different people, working with the wrong revisions, the owner's expectations is something, the architect is another thing, and the manufacturer doesn't really understand you because he has his own standards. So what we do, we use technology to help us develop a process that is more helpful and communicates throughout that platform. So the architect, the interior designer, the owner, the real estate guys, they all having the same, same information and we spread that through the internet. So today we live in a digital world where everyone expects to have information on their pocket. Uh, you will have access to all our files on a URL link with the most updated revisions. All the time you can write comments towards that design. We received it, we change. Because what does this help? Reduce the time that we waste sending emails, the weeks that we waste on bad communication. OK, so we've, we thought that we would give you an example of a current project that we're working for a cruise line. Uh, they gave us a challenge that they needed to reinvent the way they wanted to approach their, their clientele. Uh, I guess in cruise line, they, the clientele is changing and they are demanding a little bit more. And they wanted to create an advocate for their cocktail program. Um, so it was the trolley, yeah, yep. the cocktail trolley. So this is a 32-week process from workshop, understanding, drafts, virtual reality tours, which we're going to explain afterwards. Um, this is a good recommendation for you guys as well. When you want to give a brief to someone, a manufacturer, try to create a mood board to, so that manufacturer understands which direction you want to go. We like to use different materials as well towards the, the, the bars that we do. Try to draw, make a lot of drawings to understand the form, the functionality. This is our team at Behind Bars, the designers. They're trying to look for that function, trying to understand, and then boil it down to understand which one works the best. After that, we can start doing our designs in a more detailed. Does it fit the glassware that we told that it would fit? Does it fit the bottles that it needs to fit? And then we go into a different stage where we actually design it in a 3D element to get ready to go into our virtual reality room to test it. And after this, it's virtual reality, prototyping, delivery, testing, 
feedback and potentially another model if, so if everything is good. Just, just before you, you go to the next slide, I think the takeaway here for people who are thinking about how can they get their message across, um, generally what we saw and what Alex and I saw when we were starting out was there's kind of a knowledge gap between the bartender who has a great idea of how the workspace is going to look and function and the manufacturer. How do I get my, my ideas produced? So what this kind of exercise helps you do, probably you will have to go through a, a design agency or someone, someone like us or, or something like that who's going to turn your ideas into a form that can then be understood by the manufacturer, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you are gathering as much information as you can and, and can be as precise as you can, um, that will help your ideas be translated better. So the way that, the way that most manufacturers work um, are that they, ha and we're talking about stainless steel now, um, is that they have their standards. That means everything is efficient for how they work. So if you want to go outside of these standards, which most people, most people have their own idea of how things will be, if you can provide as much specific information that you will then pass on to the next guy who's going to translate those into a physical product, um, yeah, as much information as you can give will help you get back what you want. Yep. Great. So, with all the knowledge, the, the understanding on how to digitalize the process, how uh, we can expand our business to a more global ap approach, um, this is where we challenge uh, our process. Um, all the dots that you see in the map, uh, besides of Norway, we haven't, or London, we haven't visited our clients and met personally uh, throughout the process. We always meet them in a digital, like Adam is now looking at us in a, in a FaceTime. This is kind of how we meet our clients. Um, then how we share the information is through the digital process. And then we work together with architects and designers, so they also feed us a lot of information for specific projects. Yeah, th this is kind of, kind of revolutionary, and we're really helped by, by, by the technology that exists. But what we're able to do is keep a pretty compact design team based in Oslo um, and seamlessly kind of inject ourselves into projects around the world. Because 99% of the time, we are just one actor in a, in a bigger project. There, there, there's architects. There, there's interior designers. Um, you have the person who's in charge of, of the, the beverage program or the head bartender or whoever it may be. Uh, you've got the people signing off on the deals. So there's a lot of people involved. So, so what we've been able to do, um, I mean, a lot, a lot of our job is listening to, um, you know, listening to what people have as an expectation for the venue and trying to insert ourselves in there as seamlessly as, as, as seamlessly as possible. Good. Yeah. This is our office in Oslo. Um, is it playing the video? Let's see. Um, okay. It was supposed to be a video playing to the, so you guys could see how our collaboration tool works. Um, so we, we use a platform. Oh, okay, spacebar. No, doesn't work. Um, so the idea is that uh, we, we use a platform where uh, we have a stationary virtual reality uh, hardware uh, with a software. And that is spread uh, in UK, uh, in Australia, or in US. Um, and today, there is more and more coffee shops that has virtual reality rooms as well. So we could potentially also rent a space and talk with our client through those platforms. Uh, what we do is that that space we can have until 12 people working in the same room. Uh, we can have the architect in the room changing at lifetime all those design specifications that we failed on the first draft or the client wants to change something. Um, and this allows us to cut those three weeks of emails into like two hours of work. And also, we're testing the product one-to-one -one scale. We can see if it works, it doesn't work, um, and so on. But we're looking into the future. Yeah, so yeah. Um, what we've seen with VR, 
um, is that for people like me who really struggle to visualize how a 2D drawing or a 3D drawing on a piece of paper is going to translate into an actual bar. I, I, I struggle with space. Um, and when I see things that I've seen on a piece of paper in real life, um, I'm often surprised. And I think a lot of people's minds work like that. Um, and what we've seen with VR uh, is that when we can get people into a VR with a one-on-one -on -one scale uh, inside their bar, moving bottles, uh, seeing, their, seeing their venue, seeing their room, um, changes come quite quickly. When you thought that a sink should be here, once, you, once you're standing and working, you realize maybe that needs to be here. Yeah. When you have a shelf behind you and you turn, maybe that shelf is too close to your head to be comfortable. Um, and what we can do is, is, is kind of design in real time, which, which saves... Um, if you've ever been through the process of... of Often when you're making changes, you, you make a change, you get the revisions, you make a change, you get the revisions. And as we all know, you know we're, we're all busy doing stuff all the time. So this, this process takes time. And what we're allowed to do with VR is kind of work a lot faster, work a lot smarter, and at the end of the day, hopefully get a much more accurate product. Um, Should we talk future? about the VR, a VR warehouse, right? Yeah, yeah. VR yeah. warehouse. Okay. So, with all the projects that we've been doing, we, we've uh, acquired uh, information, and that information is transformed into what we are trying to standardize. So we're trying to create a warehouse of information that we know for the specific types of bars, for example, a nightclub, a cocktail bar, a lobby bar, what type of tools do they need to maximize their performance. With that information, we want to create a virtual reality room where me as a, as a, or our designer team can go in with a client, understand their space, and we can pick up from that virtual reality room and design their bar in a space of three hours. This will allow to cut a normal project that takes around 13 weeks into four weeks because you, need, you can design for three hours in the virtual reality, and then you can produce for four weeks. And just to say that virtual reality is a tool, part of everything else that we're doing. Did I skip anything? Um, no. Yeah. So for us to finish and hear from you guys, because it's always important to hear what you think is the future as well to us to improve what we do. But this is basically the synergy between the people that we work, that is the bartender, the owner, and the guests, and everything else that affects that. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, okay. uh, when Tell we're ta talking about ergonomics, what we've started doing from three weeks ago uh, is um, collaborating with um, uh, biomechanic researchers to design um, the world's most ergonomic bar that is based on how bartenders specifically move behind the bar. So, we don't know yet how that bar will look, um, but we're super excited about what the 12 months, next 12 months holds uh, for that. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before you guys leave, questions. Yes. The bar wagon you showed us, um, how much is it? <laughs> The, um, the w what was the bu uh, budget for the bar wagon for the, yeah, just budget. ballpark, yeah, ballpark, ballpark. budget, roundabout? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> that is the question that we always have with people coming to us, is like, what's the price? Yeah, yeah. Right? exactly. What's the price? Well, you pay for what you get. Um, we, we have a process, and our process is not the cheapest platform that you can go for, but we do, we are working into developing standards like the Tushmark station to be more market uh, approachable, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, what's your budget? No, not, I, I, I was asking, um, what, yeah. was, uh, what was the price of the bar wagon? Uh, so, all in all? I, I didn't hear the price well, of... What is the price of a Tushmark station? Yeah. You're yeah. Talking to okay, let me put like this. Um, when we get a client, we have a process. If a client wants something unique that doesn't exist in the market, he needs to go through that process. Yes. And that process normally 
goes through the chargeable of hours of design, research, development, prototyping, and so on. So that is more expensive. Yeah, I, if you want to get out something out of the market, you can get any anything from um, 8,000 euros up to 25,000 euros. It all depends on what you want. You want coolers? Coolers are expensive. What type of coolers? Quality of the cooler is a freezer. Uh, do you want a more insulated station with a door to close it? So there's the elements that adds to the cost for sure. Uh, so it's really hard for me to say everything that we do is bespoke. Yeah. We don't necessarily have any every standard now. So if I will give you a price today, they will set up everyone's expectations towards what a good bar should be cost because quality of material is also a player of cost, uh, craftsmanship and everything else. Yeah. I don't know if this answers a little bit. Yeah, I just yeah. was nosy because I really like the design. Uh, cool. I know it's, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a prototype and it's yeah. quite unique, but yeah, okay, if you don't want to tell me what it is, how much it is, it's okay. <laughs> I just said everything from 7, 8 to, yeah, depending on your budget. Because we also cater to budgets, uh, we're not trying to rip off anyone. We want to, to improve the industry. Uh, more questions? Thanks. Hey, uh, just a question. Uh, you know, with the change in cocktail trends across the across the globe, you know, you have more gadgets coming into play, like. You know, rotowap machines, ultrasonic homogeneous devices, and a lot of other stuff which sort of integrates in preparing a cocktail program. Uh, do you think uh, getting these into a bar design is a challenge for you and making sure they fit in just, you know, perfectly, uh, or you're able to achieve this quite easily? Do you want I, to take I think that, that that's a, a good question, and it's really, again, to reiterate a little bit about um, understanding the venue, understanding what this bar is going to do. Um, I think that the process that we go through helps to eliminate those questions afterwards. Uh, why didn't we think about having a space for some tools? You know, so when we're, when we're talking with our clients about uh, what is the expectation of this bar, what is it going to be doing? Uh, these kind of things come up um, that maybe people didn't think about before. What about power sockets? Things like this. So hopefully through that, through that process and then going into VR, the people who are going to be using that bar um, can kind of understand what we need. And then, and then, to, and then it's to, to design it and build it in. Sure. Thank you. Great. Any more questions? Uh, hi. Uh, sorry hi. if I missed this. Maybe you already said this. But how long does it take the whole process? Let's say if uh, I have a bar and I just wanted to do something and I hire you guys, how long is the process of starting everything until the very last when everything is set up in the bar? Fantastic. Um, so the question is, how long does it take to build a bar? Um, that depends on this, the, the, the size of the bar and, and, and your ambition as, as a, a bar owner or a bartender, what you want to take out of it. Our minimum um, week frame is 13 weeks from a small uh, bar station. We work in an industry where people remember about things in the last minute. They call us, hey, I need a bar, new, authentic, different, tomorrow. We can't fulfill those, those expectations, but if we have time, we can do a lot of things and a lot of great things. We work from projects from 13 weeks to two years. And the, the earliest that we are in a project, the better result will, will be, for sure. Just one more thing. Uh, so the next thing would be like, do you construct everything on your own or you outsource it to, to somebody else? So like we mentioned before, we, we work with different countries um, and we believe that working with local manufacturers, producers, plays a big role. We are a design agency that has partners in manufacturing that follows the standards that we believe that is the best for sure, and also for transport issues, costs, and so on, because we are aware of costs and how much it is important to not overspend, because everyone is on a budget, basically. Thank you. You're welcome. I think there was a, a question, yeah. 
I wanted to ask, you are doing ergonomics for people behind the bar, and I have a girl who's 150 working, and I am 190 working. How do you incorporate the different body sizes? Good that you asked that. Good, our, good question. Yeah. Should I talk about yeah, the theory? Yeah, so our uh, colleague Adam has, uh, came to me with an idea. Alex, what if we build a bar that goes up and down, front and back? I was like, that is a, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I was like, that is a really cool idea, but I don't think a bar owner will be willing to pay 10,000 euros more for those uh, hydraulic systems. So we look into what architects do. There is a, a standard average of every continent, and we look into those measurements. We try to find what is the balance between a 150, 190, and evaluate. Yeah. It's not easy. And, we're, it's not and, easy. and, and, and <laughs> that, that's kind of why we're, we're, we're working now with people who do this for, for, for a, a living, if you like. Yeah. That's, um, that's the biggest problem. Yeah. 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 But we're looking into the issue. We haven't given up. We want to find a solution that is affordable uh, and it can cater to different uh, sizes, for sure. Great. There is one oh. more. Okay. <laughs> Wilson, you get, your, you get, a, get a chance. Thanks so much. <laughs> Um, talking about the future of bar design in terms of um, your input, seeing different countries, seeing working with different innovations, where do you see the current future of bar design heading? What should we look into looking at new concepts, looking at new innovations that we should consider possibly? Um, yeah, I think that uh, what we're seeing through collaborations is that people are starting to reimagine how a bar works in a space, if you like. So most people in this room will have worked behind a, a steel bench that is inside of furniture and serving their guests like that. Um, what we saw at Taya, for example, is that ideas of how we can work uh, a service bar in a venue, I think, are changing a little bit. Um, I think from our side, uh, when it comes to what we are thinking of innovating uh, as a design agency, for sure is yeah, how, you know, how are the bars going to be different in form and function, if you like, but also how can, we, how can we innovate our process and compress timelines uh, and compress costs uh, and, and kind of make things faster, more affordable, if mm. you like, and, and, and better. But also to add to that, today uh, people are showing more their bar, uh, bar space and how they work, and I think today that's a, a, a big trend is to do the flushed situation where you see everything and everyone sees what you're doing. We, we always look into how to use different materials because aesthetics has become a big thing of bar design as well, not just hiding it but showing it. So for sure we take that in consideration and we are continuously trying to understand what the industry is looking for as well um, to improve it, for sure. Are there? Hi. So first of all, congrats for the, the work that you guys are doing. It's super cool. Thank um, you. And uh, my question is, so imagine that we already designed my bar, right? And uh, I'm testing it. So if I ask you on the spot, can you make this bar or this station 10 centimeters higher, you make it on the spot? Because I'm like, OK, I want this to be 120 meters higher. And then I try. I don't like it. I want it to be higher or a little bit yeah. lower. Can you make it like on the spot, on these the spot. little changes? So when we build the bar, uh, when we build the bar, there is a tolerance, right? So uh, depending where we I think are in the world. talking about in VR. Oh, yeah. virtual reality? Or when we're designing the bar. Oh, in virtual reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we are working live. So the architect is there and you're saying, oh, I wonder how uh, one meter works. And she on the spot changes. And uh, it's a very interactive, constant uh, process. Sorry? Yeah, for a guy like me that I'm always changing my mind every second <laughs> is perfect. That's why I was uh, wondering. Yeah. As you. long as you follow the process and the milestones. <laughs> it's good. Hi, guys. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one specifically from the flash bar situation that you guys were talking about. 
and in recent, my context is more from Asia where uh, clients do ask for it, but one of the biggest problem that they have is reflective surfaces and how light kind of plays on it. Uh, especially the whole speakeasy and dim light lighting situation is, is what they are kind of going for now. And the biggest problem is reflective surfaces. In your research, have you been able to find out any other color on the steel that's being used or any other surface that kind of takes care of it? I mean, part of the innovation of product is trying new um, products, <laughs> for example, materials, I, I mean. Um, and also finishes, right? So you have polished, you have brushed, you have uh, a, a brush that is circular, a brush that is straight, and all of that affects light uh, impact on the station, right? Uh, currently, we see a big trend, and this coming from Australia, is people want black bars, bars that are colored. That is really hard because we know by fact, if you powder coat it in a station, it's not going to save from cracking. But we're now testing a solution that is, um, so we destroy the, the, the steel uh, uh, properties, we apply a chemical that changes the color, and then we again save the, save the steel to become uh, useful for um, food service. And it becomes black, and then it won't uh, affect scratches, it's going to be that color forever, right? And this kind of innovation is happening as, as we are reaching out to our suppliers as well and trying to push them. I mean, because we are kind of in the middle, uh, pushing our suppliers all the time to see what, what, what we can do. Uh, yeah. Uh, second question uh, that we have been discussing quite a bit is, of course, over at Europe, New York, bartenders are super highly trained. They know how to clean the bar down. But towards our side, though, it's coming up as a pattern a lot of bartenders are not able to clean the bar as they're supposed to, again, because of the surface. Uh, they don't have the right cleaning agents because it tends to get super expensive. Do you guys have a training process or any documentation or deliverables in place that tell the clients that this is what they need to do? Is it weekly, daily, so that there are no lime marks or sugar marks? How to maintain the yeah. bar? Um, for sure, it's important for us to communicate to the client how to treat the material, but that also defines a good bar and a bad bar, right? If you don't have process and procedures to keep your bar clean, there is much that we can do. Um, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> we do have a documentation on how to treat the, the, the material, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Who's taking notes, uh, Samantha? You taking notes of all of this? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> How have, you ever, have you ever helped consult with uh, mobile bar operations, uh, like pop-ups, et cetera? Yeah, um, super cool that you asked that. Um, we are currently working on a project internally uh, to reinvent how portable bars work. Um, and we hope that we can put out in the market next year. I don't want to say when, because production is always goes back and forward, uh, but we're looking into it. And the biggest, biggest challenge on portable bars is bartenders working in an environment that doesn't have water, doesn't have um, all Everybody, the things that you have in a bar. Everyone's worked in a portable bar, right? It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Normally it sucks. You've got no storage, you've got no sink, you've got nothing. Uh, you've just got a kind of bench. And that's, that's the kind of, yeah. that's what we're, we saw a problem. And, and we're, yeah. yeah, we're trying to bring water to portable bars. <laughs> we're trying to bring everything that you don't have normally yeah. in a compact, portable way. Uh, but we will, we will share that, that project next year, for sure. Cheers. Um, as far as like health code compliance uh, from country to country and city to city, do you guys look into all the details for that or is that on the buyer side? For sure. I mean, we look, we're working with um, a cruise line that is owned uh, partly by an American company and we have never experienced such a complex compliance on hygiene as, as, as it comes from US. Um, so yeah, we had to read those 200 pages of uh, um, uh, how do you manufacture, how you keep the, the cleanest uh, uh, solution for, for avoiding that 
the people using that specific uh, piece of furniture is not going to do harm harm to anyone else. We look to it to that. Yeah. Great. Right.